Our second reading this morning continues in the book of Romans, the 8th chapter, beginning at verse 12 and continuing through verse 25. Listen for God's word to you this morning. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God, for the creation was subject to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what is seen. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It doesn't take much effort to see that the creation is indeed groaning. Once again, wildfires, this time in Canada, are choking the skies with dangerous smoke, triggering air quality alerts as far south as Atlanta, Georgia. A recent report revealed that as much as half of the world's oceans are turning green, signaling a change to our planet's largest ecosystem. A discovery out of Greenland suggests that even moderate increases in global temperatures could create large-scale melting of that country's ice sheet and lead to a level of sea rise of over four and a half feet that would be disastrous to coastal areas. Unprecedented floods from Pakistan to Vermont and Kentucky are having a devastating effect on communities and agriculture, not to mention the intense heat that we've experienced here in the past few weeks and that has had as much of a third of our country under heat advisory warnings, as well as parts of Europe and Asia and the Middle East. It's enough to make us groan as well. I saw a humorous social media post this week from someone claiming to be in a new relationship with her air conditioner. <laughs> All kidding aside, the earth groans under the weight of our collective comfort and inaction toward human-generated levels of carbon and methane in the earth's atmosphere. They're contributing to rapid changes in our climate and threatening even more catastrophic consequences than we've already seen. A couple of years ago, the world's most famous astronaut, William Shatner, who really only played one on the TV and movie franchise, Star Trek as Captain James T. Kirk of the Starship Enterprise, was given the opportunity at 90 years of age to finally go into space for real, he was selected to fly on one of Amazon's Blue Origin pr private space flights that takes passengers into uh, flight into around you know into orbit and then returns them to the Earth. 
in his recent memoir, he recalls how the experience brought him to tears. But they weren't tears of joy at the thrill of spaceflight after all those years of acting. They were tears of grief. Shatner experienced something that is sometimes referred to as the overview effect. It's a common experience shared by those who have flown into space and returned. It's a term used to describe the shift in a person's awareness, their consciousness, and their identity when they see the whole of Earth from space, when they see it in the larger context of the universe. In Shatner's words, it was death that I saw in space, and the life force that I saw coming from the planet. I realized that one was death and the other was life. I wept for the earth because it's dying. I don't, we don't have to go to space to weep for the creation that sustains us. We groan as well when we read about yet another mass shooting or the epidemic of fentanyl overdoses or the bitter polarizations dividing our country, our communities, even our families over issues of race and gender and equality. It's enough to make anyone throw up their hands and surrender and seek some form of escape or denial from the groans of a planet and its people suffering from the pain of it all. In fact, we might be tempted, as many have, to read Paul's words about living not according to the flesh but to the spirit as a roadmap for our escape. By this thinking, the problem isn't so much climate change or guns or drugs or even culture. The problem is that all of these things are simply concerns of the flesh. And by this rationale, we simply need to be more spiritually minded and let God sort it all out. It's a variation on Plato's dualism that would subordinate material reality to the more perfect spiritual abstraction. It reminds me of a conversation I had 25 years ago with a co-worker who was a person of devout faith. And when I expressed my concerns about the environment, she quipped, well, God's just going to remake it in the new heaven and the new earth, so we don't need to worry. I'm pretty sure my jaw dropped. Putting to death the deeds of the body, as Paul puts it, does not absolve us from attending to our role as stewards of God's good and very material creation. If anything, it obligates us to consider how we're making use of the considerable resources entrusted to us by God. Are we using them simply to serve our own needs, our own appetites, our own desires with little regard for the consequence of that consumption? Or are we using them in ways that are just, kind, and humble? Ways that conform not to actions dictated by greed and gluttony, but by love, peace, and the good of all, not some. And it obligates us not as slaves, fearful of how the master may punish us for getting it wrong, but as children who have been adopted into the family of God. It obligates us as heirs to the immeasurable riches of God's grace and mercy. If anything, as heirs, it should cause us to groan. Our inheritance, as those adopted into the household of God, is being squandered in reckless ways in which both our planet and its people are being used instead of loved. Several years ago, the Sikh activist Valerie Kaur wrote a moving prayer about all that causes us to groan. In our tears and our agony, we hold our children close and confront the truth. The future is dark. But, she goes on, but my faith dares me to ask, what if this darkness is not 
the darkness of the tomb, but the darkness of the womb. I think this is what Paul is getting at. By suggesting that our groans are not those of despair, but the groans of a world and a people laboring for the birth of something new, a world made new. In her own metaphor for the birthing of a new future, Kor invokes the wisdom of the midwife. Breathe, she says, then push. It's a helpful image for our own faith tradition. The first fruit of the Spirit is the breath of life that animates our bodies, that brings us life, that claims us and bears witness to our role as co-conspirators with God. That's what the word conspire means. It means to breathe with, to breathe together. In the pain of all that is not yet, the pain of all that we would labor to bring into the world, the, to breathe in the Spirit is to be reminded that we aren't called to do this work alone. We cannot do this work alone. If it were up to us, we wouldn't need a Savior. If it were up to us, there'd be no need for redemption. First, we breathe in the Spirit of God that gives us life, that gives us strength, that equips us for what God is doing in us and through us. Then we push. We push industry and government to take steps to reduce carbon and methane emissions. We push for sustainable and renewable forms of energy. We push with all the urgency of a people who do not despair, but hope for the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to ignite our imaginations as we begin to think and act differently about how best to faithfully care for this world that God loves so much that God willingly enters into it to be with us and for us in Jesus. And so we groan, not for an escape from our bodies, but with hope in the work of the one who adopts us as one of God's own so that we might live in the Spirit as those whose lives and bodies have been redeemed and saved for something bigger than ourselves. The hope that saves us isn't a hope for escape, for high in the sky and the great by and by. The hope that saves us is the hope that the groaning and the breathing and the pushing for something we cannot yet see will nonetheless be fulfilled. We don't despair at the state of the earth or the state of humanity. To do so is to live according to the flesh. To do so is to live in the futile expectation that we can somehow save ourselves. We are saved from such despair by the hope that God is at work in us and through us, in the world and through the world, to bring about its renewal, not its replacement. God knows this is the only creation we'll get. God knows these are the only lives we'll get. The truth is the world is not as it should be. It is groaning but it's also birthing something far greater than we can see right now, something far greater than anything we could ask or imagine. So we wait and we breathe and we push. you stand as together we say what we believe using the words of affirmation from the eighth chapter of the, of the book of Romans printed in your worship bulletin. We believe there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to God's purpose. 
we are convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. <laughs>